attentiveness this morning. Oh. Today, today, today. Larry, I'm going to put this right here. So you know where to look for it. Oh, announcements. What do we have for announcements? Got to get my bifocals fixed up. Oh. One, if you're a guest today, there are some cards somewhere around you. We'd love to have just a little information about where you came from. And if there's something we can do to serve you, to be kind to you, we'd love the opportunity to just love you in Jesus' name without any obligation on your part, just that we care about you and your family. Um, this coming Saturday is a quiz meet, and it will be at Northridge, so if you'd like to attend and support. How many more quizzes do we have left? This is our last one, so if you ever wanted to come see what this quizzing thing's all about, go to Northridge uh, about 9.30, 10 o'clock. Our kids that generally sit somewhere over here now, um, they will be there jumping out of their seats because that they're trying to guess the, the, what they know in the verses. And so you want to come and not guess. They know it. They know it. And they know it. It's an act of faith, actually. Ooh. Uh, next Sunday, we will be switching to daylight savings. So please note your clock. Otherwise, we'll be here when you get here. And we'll worship together when you arrive. Uh, I can't remember if that's early or late if you mess that up. We spring forward. So you be here an hour late because we're going to be here an hour early. So if you come at regular time, you'll get here at 1130. Just in time for us to be dismissed. Yeah, so you can go to lunch with your friends. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah, you all come. Marsha and I will buy. That sounds good. Y'all come next week. We'll, go we'll all go out together. We'll find some restaurant that'll take us. Sure, I'll even buy. I'll buy. But if I'm buying, I'm going to make something here. Because that's cheaper. Because I'm, I'm a cheapskate. But that's a whole different problem. Uh, teachers and leaders, ministry board. Oh, ministry board is next week. So we are going to be making lunch for folks who want to stay next week. So if you can come. Uh, there's a prayer dinner on the 14th. Uh, and so if, please come. We have been gathering on uh, Wednesday evenings once a month, second Wednesday, to focus on, on prayer. It's a green dinner in honor of St. Patrick's Day, which I think is on the 17th, right? And uh, so whether you're Irish or not, please come. Uh, we are making progress on our internship work. We have been praying for and asking God to send us several interns, some students who would be interested in coming and being part of our church for the summer and help with the food truck and help us connect in the neighborhoods. And uh, if you would please pray for that group. Uh, we have sent flyers to several schools, several line churches. We haven't had anyone raise their hand to say, hey, I'd like to come. But we have been trusting God with the step of sending. And it's God's job to create people to come and if he does, that's wonderful, and if not, we have stepped in faith, believing that he's going to take care of us. Either way. And so I just ask you to pray. Uh, we are looking for some housing for the interns that we believe God wants to bring. So if you have an extra room in your house and you'd be willing to lend it to a, a student through the summer, we'd love to talk to you about that. We're also looking for some funds to help pay these kids, because we'd like to give them $1,500 for their investment for nine weeks as a kind of a scholarship thank you. And so we're someday going to start a special for that, but we haven't done it quite yet. But in the back of your mind, if you allocate some money toward helping fund that, that would be terrific, and God's going to do something there. Ladies Retreat is coming up April 20 through 22nd. You need to register soon. Talk to Becky Armstead in the back. And then uh, I have a, I've been thinking about a neighborhood faith initiative. God has been calling me to connect to the neighborhoods. And uh, I would like to invite you, if you have an interest in connecting in the neighborhoods, to reach out to me. And uh, we'll share some ideas and see what God is developing. And uh, there's more in the bulletin. If you have your with, your, uh, with love from Jesus, <laughs> if you have your Seek God for the City book with you, today begins a new theme. Slide five, it's coming, I'll put it up in a second. 
This week we're praying for transformation in our communities. Last week we prayed for God's power to reign over darkness. That was last week's prayer time. To pray that God would tear down strongholds, that God would tear down evil things in the world. And this week we're praying that he'll transform our communities. And so the two scriptures that we're going to meditate and pray over just briefly are from Isaiah 61 that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Those are people who suffer. Sometimes those sufferings are physical. Sometimes they're emotional. Sometimes they're financial. Some of them are the more health-related. To bring good news to the afflicted so that they will be called, this is the change, that transformation, so that they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins, they will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. It's looking forward to God doing this incredible work. And then in Luke 4, Jesus said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. And that God has put this church on a hill because he wants us to be part of transforming the neighborhoods, to be part of transforming where you work, where you live, who we know and who we see, sometimes in our families, sometimes beyond that. So let's take just a little time, and again, if you are an out loud prayer, you can do that. If you're a quiet prayer, you can do that. It's okay. We're just going to linger here for about three or four minutes, and would you pray that God would transform our church, our neighborhoods, that God would do what he's talking about here in this text, to raise up people as oaks of righteousness, um, sycamores of their growth and green and strong and true. Just pray that God would raise that up and maybe that he would use us to be an agent for that. Let's pray. Father, we want to be a house of prayer just like you said we should be. And today we have been focusing our attention on your character, your love, your mercy, your sacrifice, your graciousness, your goodness. And we know you want to do good things in the lives of people around us. And we want to pray for that. But I, I pray that you will give us people of peace in our neighborhoods, that we can love our neighbors, that you'll give us people in our own, where we physically live, people who resonate with our desire to be kingdom-minded people, that will reach our neighbors and our neighborhoods where we actually live with a message and the hope of Jesus. What would you pray for?
Father, we bring these things to you because you want them to happen. You want for those that are afflicted to know the grace and mercy of the God of the universe. You want for them to hear about Jesus, and you want us to be part of that. So we ask for what it is you want, and we pray that you'll give us courage to believe, strength to move forward, and power to, to speak and listen in loving ways. That your kingdom would be in us and would come out of us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, would you please turn to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12. Today we are embarking on a quick and interesting journey through Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Marcia and I had the privilege yesterday of going to Deepak and seeing the Phantom of the Opera. Fantastic musical event. Uh, beautiful scenery, beautiful decor. Just imaginative presentation. And it, uh, anyone been there? Anyway, it's it's, a, it's a, just a fancy, beautiful place. What image do you get in your mind when you think of the D-Pack? I see that. She's like, I don't know. See, if you've never been there, it's hard to picture it. But as I've seen things on the news, you know, it looks like it's big and regal and like when you go, like they treat you like royalty. And it's true, when we walk through the door there with these guys in nice coats and top hats and they open the door and they were like so polite and nice, it was like, you guys spent $60 on these tickets, please come. We are so happy that you're here. You know, they want you to feel like this is a place for you. And as you walk in, you step through these, this into the red carpet. It's really red. It's red like Lydia's shirt red. It is red red. It is bright red because they want you to feel like you're special. And when you sit down, the seats are cushy and squishy. And, and the temperature, we sat at the top, and it was warm and comfortable. Oh, it was so nice. You know, you and I have a reputation, just like the DPAC has a reputation, that when you think of that entity, that thing, they're trying to create in you a, a, a picture so that when you go, you have a particular feeling. Well, that's called your reputation. When it comes to us, we are to have a reputation too, a reputation that aligns with what Jesus is like. We're told in Philippians 2 that as followers of Jesus, we're to display the marks of Jesus. You know, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And it talks about service. It talks about humility. It talks about preferring others, that we would shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. In the book of Romans, Paul paints a picture of the grace and mercy of God in contrast to working our salvation out by our works. He talks about how the Israelites, that they worked really hard, but Jesus came that they would believe God and that their belief would be credited to them as righteousness. So that God's reputation... would be known and people would follow him. You know, sitting here, I think we all agree that God is great, that Jesus rescued us from our sins, that we are to live a life of victory and joy in the kingdom, right? We would all agree with that. But in the day-to-day -day kind of things that we walk through, sometimes we aren't so sure. Sometimes the the challenges of life get us down. And this week I had some pretty down times. There are way too many projects that are half done in my life. Things I'd like to get to and things I haven't. And they make me feel hopeless. And some days I get feeling bad for not being together enough. For not being better at relationships. Not seeing more people 
flocking to join our church family, not yearning for God's kingdom enough. And some parts of my way, life that feel undone feel weightier than other parts that are working pretty good. And when these times come, I feel like my reputation, Jesus' reputation gets tarnished, and I lose sight of Jesus as my rescuer, the hero of the story, and I begin to think that my journey is more about my weaknesses than my faith in the Jesus that loves me, in spite of my weaknesses. Well, Paul in Romans 12 transitions from this theory where God loves us because we believe to because we believe there are some things we ought to do. So if you'll open to Romans chapter 12, we're going to read a few verses and then we're just going to quickly hone in on one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what is it we're to do there? We're to be living sacrifices, and we're to have our minds transformed by being in the scriptures, by listening to the Spirit of God, by receiving the love and the mercy of God, that we would be worshiping, giving ourselves in worship. Verse 3. For the, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, and to us, okay, it's not just to them, to us, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Oh, I, that, that already poked me there, because I think of myself highly. You think of yourself pretty highly too, right? I mean, that's why you think everything should be about you. I mean, well, okay, we won't go there. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, or realistically, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, each member belonging to the other. We have different gifts, and according to the grace given us, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So basically he's saying if you have gifts and talents and skills, you should use them in church. You should use them in the body. God has given you them for the good of the whole. It's not just yours. Now, sometimes we say that makes us better than others because we've got gifts that are clearly up front. Like some people would say, okay, Pastor Dan, you've got a bigger role in church than what I have because you like talk all the time. Well, I want to tell you that your role in church is more important than my role in church. And in fact, I will also tell you that if you stop doing your job at church, our church would fall apart. I'm not kidding you. Okay, when Ruby got sick and was not able to be in the office, there are things in our church that fell apart because she did not have her, she could not exercise her gifts. I guarantee you that if Miss Lisa and Miss Anita stopped putting together the nursery schedule, there are things in our church that would fall apart. If Miss Marcia didn't put together the worship sets, I could not put them together as neatly as what she does. If John did not come and use his gifts, if our musicians didn't come and sing and use their gifts, if Dick Hines didn't use his administrative gifts to help pull together the, if John didn't use his, we all have gifts to use, but that doesn't make us better than the other. It just makes us one of the family, and we all have gifts. But that's not what we're going to focus on today. That was just a freebie. The next part is the one that really gets me. Because he comes down to this list. You know, when, when Paul gives this list, sometimes it's disheartening. Because he lists this whole list. Listen to this list. These are all things that you should be doing. I just want to say that. So that you get the burden that this is your job to do all this stuff. Okay? Love must be sincere. So you have to love sincerely without any hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. 
Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice in those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Do not be willing to, but be willing to associate with people who are in low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. If he, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, the only problem with this nifty list is about the time we got to item number two, we said, mm, that's not realistic. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that that really, really means that we should do that. Because that, 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 that's, that's a lot. Can he possibly mean that we ought to do all that stuff? Can he possibly be suggesting Let's just look at just three things. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. So let's just pick these three things as token items so that we can consider just these three. Now at first glance, you would think that these three things are three activities that we're to do that we are to be joyful in hope that we ought to be filled with hope right no that's not really what he's saying and then it says patient and affliction so we should suffer well no, that's not quite what he's saying either faithful in prayer so we should pray a lot well he's not really saying pray a lot either See, these, all three of these things are nouns. They're not verbs. These aren't action words. These are places of being. He's not saying that you should fill yourself with hope. He's not saying you should place yourself in affliction. He's not saying you should make yourself pray more. As if in praying more, you become something. Because these are nouns. And what is a noun? We all learned it in elementary school. Noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. Right? A noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. So these are all places we find ourselves. Now, now we all get being found in tribulation because we all found ourselves in tribulation this week. It wasn't hard to find tribulation, was it? You just got up. And then you got to work. Or you opened the news, you opened your email, and you got tribulation. If you don't, it's, it's a place, and you find it. It's, you, everybody's trying to get out of it, right? But what about this place of hope? What about this place of prayer? And what are these other words in front? See, those other words are, if you look in the Greek, they're participles. They're adjectives. They're descriptors. They're active parts where we're to be inging them. Jumping, running, hoping. So what does it say? He's really saying we are to be joyful. We're to be joyful in. Now, how do you be joyful in? And then we're to be patient in. We're to be being patient. 
And then it says we are to be faithful in. Your Bible might say constant or, or um, continually being. Like that's what we are to be being. Now here's the challenge. All this is impossible, and we are futilely trying to be it. And really what God is inviting us to is to live a life in the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, God is the king. And in the kingdom, God is the place where he is with us in all these things. And when it says joyful in hope, that place of hope is living in the kingdom where the king is in charge and we are his subject. Where the king is understanding what our problems are and if we're living in the kingdom, we're living in a place of hopefulness. Because God is in charge of the kingdom. So he's, Paul is saying because God has rescued you from darkness, you should be being joyful because you are in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is filled with hope. Because in the kingdom of God where God is in charge, nothing happens by accident for us. Nothing. No flat tire, no headache, no foot ache, no trauma, no... Because the king is in charge of his kingdom and you are in it. You are in the kingdom of God. You are breathing and living in the kingdom of God. Be joyful because you are in a place of hope and blessing as a child of the king. In affliction, in trial and tribulation, what does he say to be, be doing? Be patienting. Ah, so I made that word up, okay. Be being patient. That means don't rush out. Relax. And instead of focusing on the problem, focusing on the king of the kingdom. Because if the king is actually in charge of the kingdom, do we need to be afraid of our trial and tribulation? No. But are we? Yes. So be being joyful in a place of hope. Be being patient in a place of trial. And then what? Be being constant. Be being faithful in a place of prayer. We've talked before about how prayer is more of a relationship than it is an activity. And that really what we're doing when we're praying is we're coming to be with God. And we're acknowledging that we're with him, and he's the king, and we are his subjects. In fact, we're his children, and as children, we say our Father who is in heaven. Because he's our Father, we come as kids, right? I know when my kids were in tribulation and their stomach hurt, they would climb up on my lap when they were little. Now they're big, they don't do that so much. In fact, they don't do that ever. But when they were little, they would come and they would climb on my lap and they would say, oh, Dad, my stomach hurts, and I would comfort them because I cared about them. And they trusted that I would know enough to take care of them. Do you know our Father in heaven has a place for us to go? It's a place of hope that in every place of tribulation, we can go to a place where God is and talk to Him. And He says constantly, constantly, a uh, verse in Hebrews, the effective prayer of a righteous man, the faithful prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's a sense of being with God frequently in prayer, in a place where God is. And the challenge is, is that we don't do that very well. And because we know we don't do it very well, we get kind of hopeless of the whole thing. So did Paul give us a list that we can't do? Or did Paul give us a list that we require God's help and Christ to accomplish? See, Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for our sin, but he also came to offer us new life every day. He came because he wanted to be with us every day. 
He wanted us to believe Him every day with every trial and every headache and every heartache. He wanted to come that the life of the kingdom would give us hope every day and every trial. That the life of the kingdom would be with us every affliction. That the life of Jesus would be with us at every place where we come where we need God's help. And we'll be with Him in relationship. See, that's the beauty of our salvation. It's not one and done prayer 20 years ago. It's every moment of every day. And every day when we're faced with the opportunity to try out these activities where we love when it's hard, and we're humble when we get proud, and where people are unkind to us and we have to do it, be kind to them in any way. Really what we, what we need to be aware is that Jesus offers us Himself to walk with us in that hardship. And He offers that as a picture in communion, but He offers us in reality Himself every day. You know, Marcia and I, we went to the DPAC last night, and we enjoyed it very much, and we breathed in the DPAC air, but when we left the DPAC, we left it. And so, I didn't wake up this morning on a red carpet. I didn't wake up feeling the music of Deepak as it rumbled in my seat. I didn't wake up feeling the cushiness of the seats I was in that was just a slight bit too straight. I did not wake up smelling the aroma of the Deepak. Why not? Because I woke up in my bed at home. Because if I'd have slept there, they'd have thrown me out and taken me to jail. I didn't wake up there because I left there. You know, sometimes I wonder if we think that we leave the kingdom and that because we're no longer in church, the kingdom is not within us. Jesus was so clear that you do not leave the kingdom. The kingdom is with you every day. The kingdom is in you. Jesus is in you. The Spirit of God is in you. Do you believe it? Do you believe that the kingdom of God is yours in you every moment of every day? Because if the kingdom of God is in you and the Spirit of God is with you, the secret to living out these commands, these, these places that are impossible, is to see that it's the kingdom of God that raises up in you the ability to do what you cannot do yourself, to love those that are unlovely, to honor one another above yourselves, to have energy and keep going even when you feel like giving up, to be joyful in a place of hope and patient in suffering and, and continually coming back to a place of prayer, just like Jesus did. Jesus constantly had an awareness of his Father. The secret is seeing ourselves that Jesus is with us every day, walking with us. That you know, Jesus, when he went with his disciples in the boat, he went with them first in the boat he was with them he didn't say oh you disciples you're on your own go out there and do your thing he went with them on their journey he was with them in the times where they went out on their own what did he do he came and he showed up and says let me show you a better way yeah how often do we get going and we don't even notice that he cares about us every day I think the reminder today in this text in Romans 12 is that we would be people who would live in a place of hope. That we'd be people who would live in any affliction with a sense that God is with us in that trial. And we would be a people who would live in a place of relationship where God hears us because we're talking to Him regularly. So that whether we wake up or sleep, whether we go to work or come home, that we know that Jesus is with us every day. Every day, every moment of the day, He is with us and He, 
He waits for us to commune with Him. Waits eagerly to celebrate the Lord's Supper every day with you. In October, my desire to change my backyard overwhelmed me. It was a terrible mess, and I decided that I was going to start digging out this new patio in my backyard. It was the stupidest thing I ever did. Okay, I just want to tell you. I did not realize how much work digging out this stupid patio was going to be. I had this image that it was going to be beautiful, and I embarked on this thing, and as I embarked, I started digging, and the more I dug, the more I had to dig. You know how it goes. The more you clean one area of your space, the more it ripples over to other areas. And pretty soon, I'm like digging this whole thing. And the whole reason I started doing it was because my father was coming, and we needed a project. If I'd have just told him that he should stay in Pennsylvania, that would have saved me hours and hours of backbreaking labor. But no, I said, please come, I'd like you to visit, which was true, I did want him to visit. But I got digging, and the more I dug, the more I had to dig. It just got worse and worse and worse. But I was very grateful that when he came, he came to help me where I was. He came to help me at a time that I needed him the most. And he was delighted to be with me as we worked on this project together. And now as I go out into my backyard and I look at the project that we did together, I am reminded of how he was with me in the project, even though it was hard. You know, in your life, the projects are really hard. But I want to affirm that Jesus wants to be with you in your projects. So that as you look back, you can see his presence and his autograph. So as I look at the steps going up into my back porch, I look at how the left side is slightly different than the right side. And I am reminded that my father is even less accurate than I am. And he had his autograph in my back steps because he was not as particular. And he said to me, you know, Dan, I'm okay however these turn out. I said, really? He says, yeah, I'm leaving in like three days. (laughs) (laughs) This is your project. But you know, the steps work, it's okay. And when I look at my steps, I see the autograph of his kindness. You know, Jesus wants to be with us in a way that when we look back, we can see the autograph of his presence in our lives. He says to you today, I am with you in your hardship. I'm with you in your struggle. I care about your heartache. I wasn't joshing when I said that he died for your present-day affliction. He really did. And he really wants you to not walk through it by yourself. He really wants you to walk through it with brothers and sisters on the journey. He really wants you to walk through it with himself with you. Because he really does love you that much. And just because we leave the DPAC doesn't mean we leave the kingdom. And when I woke up in the morning, what is that verse we learned last summer? The mercies of God are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. We sang it today. Every morning, His mercies are new every morning. Do you believe it? Do you believe His mercies are new? I really, I have pondered this thing that John brought up for Len. He talked to me about this on Wednesday night. This whole, uh, the night I was betrayed, I broke, took bread and broke it and gave thanks. And he had this conversation with Paul's writing about this conversation Jesus had with his disciples. Who betrayed Jesus that night? Like, I have reflected on that all week. It was people like me. It was the good, faithful, loyal followers of Jesus that ran out on him. And he still died for them. It was the so-sos that kind of got rid of him. It was the Peters that, that when put to the test, bailed. 
It was the Mies. And when I looked at the table today, I looked at it differently because on the night he was betrayed, people like me walked out on him. And he loved me anyway. And he loves you anyway. And I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you're struggling to find this place of hope, but the place of hope is with Jesus in the kingdom. I don't know if you're in a place of tribulation, but God has not accidentally put you there. There are things he wants you to discover about himself that are precious and valuable. Don't rush out of it. And faithfulness and prayer cultivate an awareness that God is with you in the moment. Brother Lawrence had this picture of this everyday rhythmic conversation that was real, that Jesus never leaves you. And it doesn't matter if you speak English or Spanish or French or Swahili or Chinese. We were walking out yesterday at the deep pack and there's people in front of us speaking Chinese and God hears people that speak Chinese. It doesn't matter your language. Sometimes there are no words for the suffering we feel. And even then, God is with us in the heartache. God is with you in the heartache. As we sing this closing song, would you just please call out to the, the God of the universe that Jesus would feel near you, that you would submit yourself to him. And if you want to come and pray, come and pray to a place where you're with God having a conversation because he loves you that much. Father in heaven, we are yours. And this is your day. And you are for us. And you love us. And you want to make us oaks of righteousness that live by faith and not by sight because Jesus is our friend and our savior and our rescuer, our deliverer. And this morning we are here today and we need your help and we come to you because you are our, our help. We need you, Father. And we are doubtful and we are fearful and we get consumed with our things. And you remind us today that you love us so tenderly. And we want to receive that love, receive that mercy, receive that grace. That we would be in a place of hope, in our place of trial, in a place of relationship. In Jesus' name.